Finally, uh, there are, there is some experimental evidence that a strong sense of purpose increases our self-worth. And that comes, uh, this study, I want to show you just this graph, um, 171 pre-adolescents, so pretty young students, were actually, uh, they had a self-esteem assessment, again, self-reported, that was administered before and after a mandatory helper intervention in school, so it was a one-year helper program, where they were told they had to do something uh, that contributed to the well-being of other people. They had to, to do uh, either tutor other younger students, help seniors, a local senior center, things like that. And, and you can see from this graph that actually uh, measures of self-report that um, the group that was in the experimental group that actually were, were forced to do this, didn't have a choice about it, they rated their self-esteem group higher than a control group that was not uh, given the opportunity to do this. The thinking being that even when you are pushed into doing something that is meaningful, that gives you a sense of purpose, it actually makes you feel better about yourself. All right, so based on that, we decided that an important intervention to help students was to help, help, actually help them define for themselves a mission statement. Right? The corporations have mission statements that define the reason for their existence. We sort of said, you know, they, people, whether they are consciously aware of it or not, get up every day motivated by some fundamental reason or reasons that makes them do what they, whatever they're doing. And most of us, most of the time, don't think about this during the course of our day. But all of us in this room, in some sense, are doing what we're doing because of some ultimate reason, some sense of purpose. Now, there may be, of course, there are many other reasons for doing what we're doing that are not so lofty. But there usually is where we, where we want them to be connected to, to an important reason. And, and the idea here is to define a statement that uh, it speaks about the value you are most interested in creating for other people. That the, the importance we assign our lives to some degree is related to the value we are able to create with those lives for other people, society, the contribution that we make. We wanted the students to identify the, that value statement as, as what they felt was the most important thing that they could do with their life. Not necessarily the thing they wanted to do the most, but the most important, important thing. And one of the, the, uh, the metaphors we used, the way we got them to sort of get into this, which I'll tell you about it was to imagine that, so I was going to imagine at the end of your life, you're 90 years old, and you are being given an award on a national stage by the President of the United States. An award that sort of defines what your life was about and what you, what you, your legacy, what you did here. What would you want that award to be for? The idea is not along these lines that the mission statement about my mission is to be a doctor or my mission is to be a teacher. That's actually the way I define it as a strategy with which you, can, which you can use to fulfill your mission. So for example, being a, uh, not my personal mission, but what I articulate to myself is, my mission here, the reason I get up in the morning, the reason I do just about everything I do, is to help relieve suffering. That, that very succinct statement resonates with me in a way that if, if the president were to give me an award at the end of my life and said, an award for someone who's able to actually relieve more suffering than anyone else, that would to me feel like the, meaning, the most meaningful life I can. Being a physician is only one way to do that, a strategy. The strategy would be through writing, through my writing. I actually seek to relieve suffering, ultimately. So we wanted to, the students to sort of focus on, on finding that state. Um, and, and the idea is, is that they, they want to actually be able to articulate it in one or two sentences. And the underlying idea here is that a mission, in a sense, is discovered, not decided. By that I mean, we're not in charge, necessarily, of what we feel is meaningful or important. And so I didn't want students to sort of create a statement about what they thought should be important to them, or what they thought other people thought were, was important to them, like their parents, but what they already emotionally had an investment in and felt was important. So along those lines, we decided rather than to ask them to sort of just make up what they wanted to be, we wanted to help them discover it. And this is how we did it. The very first session, we actually asked them to list all of the most joyful activities in which they had participated uh, thus far in their lives, both one-time activities and things that they did on an ongoing basis. And also to think about, simultaneously, people they most admired, you know, often you know, famous people, but people they most admired. And then to figure out why they admired them, what they admired them for, and then to go through it and take that list of all the things they enjoyed and cross off the things that really were uh, 
they enjoyed it for themselves. It did not, in some sense or some way, make a contribution to create value for other people. We really were looking for the things they already felt were the most important ways they could contribute. So we went through that exercise, then we brought them back, and we actually had them derive a mission statement common the items that were left. And interestingly, most of them were able to, to, to make this work for them. They actually, some of them were quite surprised by the statements they came up with, but um, it really, they thought the exercise really was uh, worthwhile and forcing them to think about something they rarely did. And, and so the whole the goal of the second session was for them to actually come up with this very succinct statement, which they did. And the third session was to actually help them figure out how then they can use that in their daily lives to increase their grit. And the idea was basically that if this is the most important value that they feel they have to contribute, or among the most important ways they can contribute, when they have a, a goal in their lives, so for example, you know, passing this test, or uh, doing a project in a class, and obstacles arise from anything from the you know, sleep to they fail the test, whatever it was, the idea is when you feel that what you're doing is important enough the theory is that will push you on through obstacles that make you want to quit. And so we were trying to teach them to connect their daily struggles, their daily goals, to this mission statement in some way. We gave a really great example of where the idea came from, at least in my mind, why this works. My wife is, a, uh, is one of the most resilient people I know, has incredible grit, and as an adventurer, an adventurer junkie, and decided one day she was going to climb Mount Rainier, which uh, you may know or may or may not know is considered to be the gateway to the Himalayas. It's one of the most technical, technically difficult climbs in North America. She trained for six months for this. She was on a stair stepper uh, doing intervals. I'm sure you guys know what intervals are. You, know, you go up for two minutes at a, a, a basically a non-sustainable rate, then you come back down and rest for two minutes, and you go back up. She was doing this on a stair stepper with a 50-pound weight vest. And so then the, the, she, she uh, got to the mountain uh, and was uh, all set to climb. And she told me the first night, even just getting from, from the bottom of the mountain to the base camp, it was almost impossible, much harder than she expected. And she was worried about altitude sickness and was taking medication to help with that. And then she, so they started the climb. They actually woke up. They, they, they got to base camp at 6 o'clock. Uh, they slept from 6 to mid midnight. They were supposed to sleep from 6 to midnight. Of course, no one did because they were so excited. The idea is they wanted to leave at midnight, so they were hitting the summit just as the sun was coming up. Because if they were if they were descending midday and the snow was starting to melt, there were crevasses that they could fall into. It was much more dangerous. So in the, in the middle of the night, pitch black, not pitch black. There's a full moon, uh, but middle of the night, wrote to her you know team members in the front and behind her. She's climbing this mountain, and she told me to wait you know, to get an idea of just how hard this was. You know, she said, think about those intervals where, you know, in two minutes, you could barely sustain it, and then you could rest for two minutes. She said, it was like being at this level for two hours. And she said, absolutely the hardest thing she ever did in her life. And she's running marathons, she's, she gave birth to my son. <laughs> and she said there were multiple times along the way where she really was ready to quit. She was going to say, I, she was about to put up her hand to the guy and say, I cannot go another step. I don't know what I was thinking. This is just too hard. You know, because her primary motivation going out there was she loves to challenge herself. She wants to know what her limits are. And that didn't, she didn't care. She was done. And every time that happened, one thing stopped her. Her brother was with her. And she thought, if I stop now, he was roped behind her. If I stop now, I'm letting him down. And that was intolerable to her. That was so important to her that it prevented her from doing what she really wanted to do was quit. And so I told the students, what you're looking for in this mission statement is something that feels so important to you. And when you are aiming at a really big goal in your life, whether in school or beyond that, and obstacles arise as they will, that that, when you are ready to quit, you remember this reason why you started in the first place, and that it feels so important to you. You don't. You keep going. <clears throat> okay. So that was the first quarter we talked about defining mission statement. Then we started on the second quarter. Here we started with the, the cognitive uh, interventions. The, the, uh, and the first one was had to do with low power. So this is a, a table from a study by a very famous guy who many of you may know because he was here, Walter Mitchell, who in 1970 actually wanted to know, um, you know what actually is the best way to avoid temptation. And so he very famously placed um, cookie 
well, actually two cookies, in front of a group of uh, children, uh, preschoolers. One of which he said, he asked them, which of these cookies is the one you really want to eat? Now, he called that the preferred reward. And then he put the other one was sort of um, the, uh, the immediate reward. They wanted to let them have right away. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the room. And uh, what, I, what you can do is, if you want to eat this, this less preferred reward uh, right away, you can. But if, in order to do that, you call me back in the room by eating a pretzel. I don't know why they did that. But call me back in the room, eat a pretzel. I'll come back in. Then you can have the, the immediate reward, the one you're not as excited about. But if you do that before I come back in on my own, you can't have the second reward, the one you really want. And then what he did is he mixed the groups. And in some cases, you can see you know, there was no reward present. He took them with him. In one case, he left both rewards. In one case, he left the preferred reward. But in the other case, he left the less preferred reward. And you can see these are the mean times that these kids waited before they actually uh, sort of ate the pretzel to signal the game to come back in. And what he learned was that willpower is a poor tool for resisting temptation. That the more the kids focused on the reward, the faster they ate it. And, and when they were, the rewards were not even available for them to, to see, they were completely unavailable. When both were unavailable, you can see they waited the longest. Interestingly, in this group, there was a, a small group of these children who uh, waited the, the longest of all. And he called these kids high delay children. And he asked himself, what, how did they do it? And what was interesting is what they did is they looked at and did everything but look at the reward. I don't know if any of you have seen these videos. Yeah, I mean, they, they held their hands over their ears, they sang to themselves, they played the close, everything but focused their attention on the actual reward. And so his conclusion was that um, distraction is superior to willpower for delaying gratification. And then he did another study. Uh, he actually put two marshmallows side by side in front of a different group of children, and he said the same thing. If you eat, if you want to eat, you can have one now when I leave the room, but if you have that one before I come back, you can't have a second one. And to one group of these uh, kids, he said, I want you to think about how soft and chewy and delicious marshmallows are. To the other group, he said, I want you to think about how marshmallows are like clouds. They're white, they're round, all the non-gustatory characteristics of marshmallows. And to a third group, he said, I want you to think about how tasty and crunchy pretzels are. And what it turned out is that, as you can imagine, the group that he told them, you think about the uh, the, the gustatory qualities of marshmallows, they dove in for them right away anyway. The group that actually he had cognitively restructured the way they think about marshmallows into clouds waited an intermediate amount of time. It's the group that actually focused on thinking about pretzels that waited the longest. Some of them waited all the way in the 15 minute length until he came back. And so his conclusion was that cognitively restructuring their, uh, their thinking about an unavailable pleasure was the most distracting and we wanted to try to operationalize this with our students because you know temptations abound everywhere. They get in the way of whole gene all the time. And our students can relate to this most commonly probably with regard to food, but also with regard to other temptations that prevent them from doing other things they want to do, like say exercise or study. So we, we wanted to train them to learn to resist the temptation of one pleasure with another pleasure by trying to solve a problem because problem solving is something that may be engaging and therefore distracting, and by the destructive strategy of avoidance. We also wanted to train them that they needed to plan ahead for the, the, the temptation exposure, that if they were coming up with whatever was going to distract them the moment they encountered, say, you know, a surprise plate of cookies that they were trying not to eat, if they had to come up with that at the moment, that they were going to have a harder time making that strategy work than if they had one ready in their pocket that they were going to turn to. And then we wanted them to teach them to, to employ habit, not willpower, to establish desired behaviors. So uh, this is the, the actual uh, the program we had to go through was we actually had to identify a temptation they wanted to avoid, uh, a good habit they wanted to establish, and a bad habit they wanted to break. And we wrote them into small groups, and what we did is we had them actually identify those and write up a plan for each of those things, what they were going to do, and then they were to report back to us in the next session, which they did. And um, in the interest of time, we're going to go through the rest of this little quick, pretty quickly. We went through with them how one establishes a habit. There's this thing called a habit loop. Basically, there's an environmental cue that triggers a routine that yields a reward that supports the cue triggering the routine. Habits are cued by our environment. This probably explains why when you go traveling, well ingrained habits are fall the window because those same environmental cues are no longer there. And so we, uh, a lot of them, for example, for, for uh, the habit they want to learn to 